We say God loves us. We write about it, sing about it, post online about it, but we struggle to truly believe it. Maybe we've experienced the gospel at some point, but we moved on, thinking it was for those who've never heard it before. But we've still got our secret sins, relationships that are broken. After all, how can we expect to love others if we don't really believe that God loves us unconditionally? The gospel is the most beautiful thing we've ever heard. And yet, it just seems so unbelievable. How can one man's story change our own? It's just too good to be true. Or is it? Welcome back. Oh man, come on. This is like a Sabbath afternoon tired welcome back. Welcome back. Get your hands up. Holy hands. Hallelujah. You made it. Woo. Some of you are like, oh, pastor. Wow, man, I'm still waking up from a little nap. No, friends, you're in for an amazing time today. God has prepared two holy messages that you are going to love. I'm so glad you're here for the very first one with Professor Rosario. You are also in for a treat because you're going to grow deeper with each other. I want you to give a hearty welcome, a hug, and uh, you know, just a greeting to the people around you. Say hello to them for a moment. I'm going to talk to our viewers in the camera here. So go ahead and do that right now. Those of you watching online, we love you guys. We're so grateful that you're here. You know, you could be choosing to watch all kinds of things, but you're in the spot you need to be right now. Jesus has a message for you. I really do believe that. And we're so excited that you're watching from all over the world. We've got people in Japan sending us messages, Peru, New Zealand, all over America, Canada, Mexico. Man, it is so amazing. But I also know it's amazing because the speakers and the presentations and the music has been so touching to you. Please do consider subscribing and liking every video and continue to share them. Well, friends, I want to give you the same message I just left our viewing audience. I want to tell you, please, please, please continue sharing these messages online. They have been watched almost close to 12,000 times for just the first video. So there's a thousand of you in here by the end of the time the sermon begins and then another, wow, the messages keep multiplying because of what is being shared. The gospel is so good. It is unbelievable. And yet it is so believable that I know you're going to share that with someone else. You know, and even if you don't share a single message online, I want you to make sure you share the good gospel by your life. As you leave this place, I hope that you feel more confident in who Jesus made you to be. If you are walking in here hearing something and it doesn't transform your living, what was it for? You felt good for a moment and then it's like I'm back to the same old habits, same old ways, still in that guilt cycle with the Lord. No, walk in the boldness of Jesus and his freedom and share that with other people. After the whole program is done today, after David speaks, after Pastor Rosario here, I want you to remember we're going to be doing a little fellowship time down at the You Reach Cafe. We're going to have wonderful food there, drinks, pastries. Just enjoy some time of fellowship and friendship with each other. So just prepare for that. But right now, I want to just share with you uh, the most beautiful Bible verse for each one of you just to remember the good old gospel, John 3, 16. Say it with me, friends. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing with us now. 
Amen. We're starting off tonight very strong. How many of us come full of haystacks? Anybody? <laughs> I do. It's great. It's all the best ingredients in the world just mixed together with some sour cream. Ooh, so good. Um, I hope you are well fed because this evening we are going to have dessert <laughs> in, the, in a way of word and worship. It's going to be a sweet, beautiful, precious time together. So why don't we stand and start off this evening strong as we worship God together.
Gracious God, as the voices sing and the music ascends, it truly is the worship of our hearts. We're so profoundly grateful that you are our high king of heaven. We've learned so much more about you this week, pondering the realities of your character and person have deeply warmed our hearts. People have spoken of life change, of insight into the grace and the love and the transformative power of God. For all that, we worship and bless and thank you and ask your presence once more in this meeting. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome back, saints. So there are 12 stops on our gospel train, and we have two stops left. Are you, are you preached out yet? Anybody preached out yet? Nobody preached out yet. Y'all are crazy. Y'all are crazy. Because there's been some long sermons you've sat through, right? Um, there's two more stops on our gospel train, and uh, tonight we have a double header, and I have the privilege of addressing a major, major topic. And it looks like our screen down here is not working, but our topic is a judgment to look forward to. We learned this morning that there is a paradigm shift in how we think of the gospel, right? And depending on how we perceive the gospel has everything to do with how we experience God. Tonight, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to think about the idea of the judgment. And to get started, I have good news and I have bad news. What do you want first? Bad news? Okay, I'll start with the bad news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is that the picture that most people have about the judgment is wrong. Okay, that's the bad news. You ready for the good news? You ready for the good news? Okay, here's the good news. The picture that most people have about the judgment is wrong. <laughs> okay, so it is bad news first and foremost because our conception of the judgment colors our conception of who God is, right? That matters because how we perceive God to be affects. It, 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 ideas have consequences, yes? Ideas have real consequences, Ideas affect intellectually and emotionally how we relate to God. And so if people's popular conception of the judgment is absolutely warped, which I contend that it is often the case, it colors the way people relate to God. And in many cases, they want nothing to do with God. But what's the good news? The good news is that it is an absolutely relief. It's an absolute relief to know and to believe that the God of Scripture is infinitely more beautiful than what the popular conception has it to be. Can you say amen to that? So I'm going to argue tonight, briefly, hopefully, that the judgment, the actual judgment, the way that the biblical authors understand the judgment is infinitely more beautiful than what many people perceive it to be. You with me? The caricatures in pop culture, in literature, whether it's film, and everywhere around us, the caricature is, is this, this, this fearful picture, right? Either it's God sitting on his throne, watching very carefully our every step, and just waiting for an opportunity to press the red button, right? And then the ground opens from under us and we fall into the lake of fire or something like that. Or it's, imagine in your mind's eye, use your imagination with me, you're standing in a, in a very long line waiting to get into, into court, into the judgment. This is your day of reckoning. You've taken the number, right? Everyone takes the number and, and wait in line. 
And one by one, you enter into the, into the presence of God, and you're sitting there, in, in, standing in line, and you're listening, and you're hearing people shriek and people panic as they hear their verdict, and it dawns on you, those people lived way better lives than I did, and here I am waiting for my time, right? Uh, the caricatures are everywhere around us, and they're absolutely warped. But tonight, before we get into that, I would like to begin by asking a more fundamental question. And here's the fundamental question. Why is, why is there even a judgment to begin with? If God is love, which hopefully that has been the resounding message this week, then why, why is there a judgment? And many people would love to hold on to the God is love part and to jettison the judgment part. So I, wanna, I, want to, I wanna argue tonight that the, the answer to that question is, it's not the case that God is love and there, there is a judgment also, but the case is actually that there is a judgment because God is love. You, are you tracking with me? Because God is love. And the reason for that is at least twofold. At least twofold. And it would be unloving not to have a judgment. So we're going to flip it. We're going to flip it this evening. So that when we leave this evening, we'll leave with this concept. That it would be utterly unloving for God if there was not even a judgment. So we'll start with, with two key points here. Number one, why is there a judgment? Why must there be a judgment? And the first point is because God created a universe in which Creatures have genuine free will. Okay, follow with me here. We're going to do a little bit of thinking. I know we just ate. I know I had a cookie and my brain is foggy. I don't know what you ate. But follow with me here. We're going to do a little bit of thinking and we're going to build our case here. The very nature of the way that God created the universe necessitates there to be a judgment. Why is that the case? Simply, in a world without free will, there would be no need for a judgment. There would be nothing to judge, right? It would be impossible to answer for decisions that we never actually made. So imagine for a second that God created a world where he always gets his way, where everything that happens, happens just exactly the way God forced it to happen, right? There would be nothing to judge. Right? Because we never actually made any decisions. So the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, right, all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing God actually doesn't always get his way. Now, just wrap your mind around that, though. That's crazy. That's unbelievable, right? The very nature of the universe that God has created sets it up so that there must be a judgment, we cannot jettison the idea of the judgment and just hold on to the God is, God is love part because it's one coin and, and it's, it's the two-sided coin. The one is the other. So tonight, I want to blur the line between God's judgment and God's love. I want to blur that line so that the distinction, we, we, we lose the distinction. Are you with me? So, in the present condition... Salvation has an undo button that could be activated at any time. But at some point, this world cannot just spin endlessly at no end. At some point, God's vision for a new world has to be fulfilled, right? So at some point, human free will decisions have to be finalized, okay? At some point. And this is... This is the glorious crescendo of the book of Revelation. Listen to what the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 22. Many of you have heard this passage many times, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to think about this passage from a different angle uh, this evening. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You see the pattern there. 
And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, the emphasis here, let him be, let him be, let him be, let him be. Here's the point. In the judgment, there is a sense in which God actually doesn't do anything. In the judgment, all God is doing is acknowledging human free will. So check this out. The judgment is not God choosing who will be saved or who will be lost, but rather God acknowledging those who have themselves chosen to be saved or lost. As one philosopher put it, in the end, there are only two classes of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And over here, those to whom God says, thy will be done. You know what the scariest thing about the judgment of God is? It is not, I wonder what God is going to do with me. I wonder what God is going to decide in my case. I wonder which way God is going to send me, up or down. The most terrifying thing about the judgment of God is this. God's utter respect for human free will. That is the most terrifying thing about the judgment of God. It is not that I am afraid that God is going to get his way with me. It's that I'm afraid that I am going to get my way with me. Are you following what I'm saying? This is why we talk about the judgment as the vindication of God. The vindication of God's character. Because it's set up in such a brilliant way. We're we're, we're presented with this scene of books that are opened, right? Right? It's a brilliant picture that Scripture presents that allows God to simply step back, and all he does is let it be. It's it's really incredible. In Romans chapter 1, we have this picture. uh, uh, Those of you who are, as we've been saying, heavy sevies, think about Romans chapter 1, right? And you, you remember this language? And God gave them up. And then the second time, and God gave them up. And then the third time, and God gave them over to their own desires, to their own desires, to their own desires. Do you realize that when you read that passage, if you back up several verses, the way that that passage begins is in this way. This is Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men. That's the way the passage opens up. It opens up announcing To the reader, this is what the wrath of God is like. Are you following me? And then it proceeds to explain what the wrath of God looks like. And we're dumbfounded that when we read the description of what the wrath of God looks like, you know what we're told? God says, let them be. The wrath of God takes the the, the, the paradoxical form of, of simply letting human beings have their own way. So this is the resounding message over and over again in Scripture. So the first plank in our, in, our, in our temple of God's judgment here is God's universe is such that the value of human free will makes it impossible for there not to be a judgment. It's not that God chooses that there should be a judgment is that a judgment is in the very nature of both the character of God and the nature of the universe. The only way to get rid of the judgment is to get rid of free will and to live in a universe without free will where we are mere robots that simply do everything God has forced us to do. And let me ask you, who among us would want to live in that type of world? Okay, so number two. Number two, why a judgment? Closely related to point number one, the idea of a judgment in the Bible is necessary in light of the injustices of the world due to human free will. See, there's a connection here between point one and point two. A loving God will vindicate the oppressed and the victimized so that justice is satisfied. Hear me out now. 
The judgment of God as presented in the Bible is the voice of the voiceless. The judgment of God gives voice to the voiceless. I heard somebody say one. I heard an old preacher say once. He said, there must be a judgment because there was a Hitler. There must be a judgment because there was a Hitler. David, you're late. You're late to my sermon. Meaning, meaning, think about, think about this story. Think about the, the Nazi war criminals. Uh, think about Hitler who puts an end to his life before he's able to be brought before earthly tribunals. In other words, he cheats out earthly tribunals and is able to avoid his day in judgment. Are you following me? This reminds me of this passage in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Let's see if you can finish it for me. It is appointed for men to die once. And after this, the judgment. That's heavy. In other words, even death won't excuse us because the dead are resurrected simply to meet their appointment. Right. So the judgment of God linked to justice is the second plank in the biblical picture of why there must be a judgment. Now, that's in the negative, but I want to take you, I want to journey with you to this, this incredible picture of judgment and justice in the Bible that reveals to us that the judgment of God is basically synonymous with the salvation of God. Okay, so follow this here. Giri Moscala, he's a, a biblical scholar. He writes this, he wrote this piece, this essay in the Journal of Adventist Theological Society, and he says this, in the Bible, to judge also means to justify, to deliver, to vindicate, and to help. Most of us, when we think of to judge, we don't think of this picture of what judgment is. We think of judgment as a court scene, and you're standing there, right, as the accused, and you're hoping for an acquittal. You're hoping to be pronounced not guilty, right? That's our typical picture of what judgment is. And I'm telling you, we have been missing the full picture, because if that's our narrow picture of the judgment, we're missing out on this glorious truth that the Bible presents that to judge is actually to vindicate. And I can show you case after case after case in the scriptures of how this is the way that the biblical writers often present the judgment of God. For example, Exodus chapter 6. This is what it says. Therefore, to say, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great, what everybody? Judgments. Now, now follow this here. The judgments of God are linked to the liberation of the people of God. Those two things are synonymous. When God is unleashing his judgments in scripture, those judgments are salvific events. The judgment of God brings salvation. It brings deliverance. It brings liberation, right? If this is the way you think of the judgment, your posture is, is totally different than the popular conceptions. Psalm chapter 9. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. Look how these two texts follow each other. A refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Here the psalmist, when, when the psalmist thinks about the judgments of God... He can't even write about the judgments of God without in the same thought, in the same thought process, jumping immediately into this concept of refuge for the oppressed. Refuge in times of trouble. God's deliverance, God's refusal to forsake people. This is a, this is a beautiful concept. The judgment of God is always linked to liberation, to freedom, to salvation. 
I'm making this case for a point. Because this is the only way you can possibly understand the repeated cases in the Bible where people are actually seeking out God's judgments to come sooner. Where, where people are literally praying for the judgment of God to come upon them. People are eagerly anticipating because the God's judgment was something to celebrate, to rejoice over, and to eagerly anticipate. For example, listen, listen to this. When's the last time any of you prayed this prayer? Psalm 35. Judge me, O Lord my God, according to thy righteousness. How many of you all pray, God, please judge me? <laughs> Can we say that together? God, please judge me. Look, you don't, you, they even refuse to say it. They're like, no way, I'm not saying that. <laughs> That's straight up creepy. It is kind of creepy. It's creepy unless, unless the judgment of God is synonymous to salvation, to help in times of need, to liberation. Because if that's what the judgment is, why the heck aren't we praying for it every single day? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, you're still a little hesitant. <laughs> Psalm 96, let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful. That's a whole lot of joy, yeah, in that verse. Why? Why should even the grass be singing and praising God? Because he is coming. He's coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. That's why the grass should be praising God. That is why they are pleading for the judgment to come sooner, not later, with excitement, with anticipation. So when you think, of, when you think about the judgment this way, the Bible begins to open up open up in powerful ways. Uh, for example, when we think of judgment, we think of a court scene. Understandably, the Bible often uses imagery of a court scene. But in our conception, in our Christian, modern-day conception of the judgment, we think of a criminal case. That's what we think of. The judgment is a scene. It is a criminal case. You are in a courtroom. And in that courtroom, you are the judged. And when you enter that courtroom, you enter that courtroom with a mission, your goal. Your goal in that courtroom is to be pardoned. Your goal in that courtroom is to be pronounced innocent. Because we think of the judgment as a criminal case. You follow what I'm saying? But what if I were to tell you that that's only half of the pie, and that we've been missing something all along. Because the Bible doesn't present the judgment merely as a criminal case where you're being judged as a violator of a criminal law. What if the judgment is viewed as a civil case? There's a difference there. A criminal case is a case that is tried when someone is accused of breaking a criminal law, right? But a civil case is a case, it is a dispute between two or more parties. So follow what I'm saying. In the Bible, the prophets often depict the judgment as a civil case. Now tonight, I'm not asking you to utterly deconstruct everything you know about the judgment because it is also the case that the judgment takes the form of criminal case. But what I'm trying to tell you is not to deconstruct everything you know about the judgment, but simply to complete your picture of the judgment. Okay? So civil case. Check this out. This is C.S. Lewis in his book, Reflections on the Psalms, which I recommend. He says this, the ancient Jews, like ourselves, think of God's judgment in terms of an earthly court of justice. The difference is that the Christian pictures the case to be tried as a what, everybody? Criminal case. And the Christian pictures himself in the dock. The Jew pictures it as a civil case with himself as the plaintiff. This is a civil case. The one hopes for acquittal, or rather for pardon, 
but the other hopes for a resounding triumph with heavy damages. I want you to follow with me here. Potential paradigm shift. We need not, therefore, be surprised if the Psalms, the prophets, are full of longing for judgment and regard the announcement that judgment is coming as what type of news, everybody? Good news. Hundreds and thousands of people who have been stripped of all they possess and who have the right entirely on their side will at last be heard. Of course, they're not afraid of judgment. They know their case is answerable, or you can say unanswerable. They have a solid case. If only it could be heard. And when God comes to judge, at last, it will be heard. Check this out. Oh, that's clever twist of imagery from some author named C.S. Lewis. What does that have anything to do with what Scripture teaches? Let me remind you of something. And I won't come to this too slowly because I know this is the after food session. But follow this. Do you remember our Lord Jesus telling a parable, parable about an unjust judge and a widow that's been abused? You remember this story? This is in Luke chapter 18, for those of you taking notes or watching. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells this fascinating parable. And in this parable that Jesus tells, it gives us a window into what does Jesus imagine the judgment is like? And in this parable, Jesus says there was a certain city, in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God and had no regard for human beings. Kind of a bad position to put that person in, right, as judge. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And the judge would not listen for a while, for a long while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God or give a rip about human beings, that's my translation, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she drives me crazy. These words are in red. This is Jesus speaking. And listen to what he says next. Then Jesus says, hear what the unjust judge said. In other words, Jesus then turns to the audience and says, did you hear the words that I put on that judge's tongue? Listen to what the judge is saying. And then Jesus says, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Listen to what I'm saying. The picture that Jesus presents when he wants to paint a picture of what the judgment is like, is it a picture of a criminal case or is it a picture of a civil case? He presents this, this widow and in this unjust judge, and he presents this picture where this woman is banging on the door of the court. She's banging on the door. Why? Because she knows she has a case against her adversary. And she is not afraid of the judgment. She has the opposite problem. She's trying to figure out how to get her foot into court. Are you following what I'm saying? This is precisely why. In Scripture, the judgment is something that they are longing after. Jesus says, paradigm shift in your perspective of what the judgment is all about. Let's put, this, put some flesh on this. Remember Martin Luther said, when the devil comes to you and reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Remember that whole thing? <laughs> but here's the thing. I think it's even deeper than that. Right? Because if you take this picture to be true, it's not the case where the devil is taunting me, right? Taunting me about my sins, threatening me about my guilt, about my filthiness, and that when I get to the judgment, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed. That's not the case that the Bible is presenting to us, is it? It's actually the flip here, right? In, in this sense, it's actually me taunting the devil, Right? It's actually me taunting the devil. Um, just wait till God judges me. You are toast. Right? This is the way that the tables are turned. In Jesus' conception 
of the judgment. I have filed a civil dispute against my adversary, the devil, and I cannot wait to get my foot in the door of God's court scene. You with me? Is the gospel, is, is the judgment good news, I should ask you? Yes. It's unbelievably good news. It is unbelievably good news. And it's such good news that I think it even contradicts our definitions of what good is. Check this out. Is the judgment fair? Is the judgment fair? So I went to the, to the dictionary and I looked up some definitions of what fair is. How would you define the word fair? So I went to Marion Webster. Here's the word fair. Marked by impartiality. Without favoritism. That's what it means to be fair. Okay? Conforming to the established rules. Now think about this for a second. Is the judgment fair? Is the gospel even fair? I want to suggest to you that, that no, it's not fair. Right? In fact... In fact, the way I put it here is, the good news about the judgment is that it's not fair. In what sense? I just read you the definition. Fair means to be impartial and to be without favoritism. The whole story of the judgment in Scripture with Jesus as our advocate is that Jesus has favoritism toward the sinner. You hear what I'm saying? That Jesus is partial toward the sinner. L listen to the um, Cambridge Dictionary. Fairness would mean not allowing personal opinions to influence your judgment. Aren't you glad that your Savior, that God, the God of the universe, allows his personal opinions in regard to the sinner to influence his judgment? Now, watch this. The gospel is actually not fair. Process this. Undeserving sinners receiving unmerited favor. Ask yourself the question, what, pray tell, is fair about that? Are you with me? The Bible tells us, it unfolds, we receive grace and we receive mercy. What is grace? What, what, grace and mercy. Grace is when we receive the good that we do not deserve. And mercy is when we don't receive the bad that we do deserve. And Scripture bathes the judgment of God with grace and mercy. Right? Um, Every time I think about grace and mercy, I'm reminded that um, many years ago, I was driving through South Dakota with my brother, Yamel, who's over here somewhere. And we were driving through South Dakota, and we see the cop lights behind us. Yeah, always right. And we get pulled over, and the police officer comes to the door, he's his license and registration, he takes it back to his car, and he's looking at his car. I don't know what they do in the computer in their car. You know how they're in the car looking at the computer? And then he comes back and basically he says, there is a warrant out for you. And he points to my brother. Not to me, but to my brother. <laughs> because um, I'm obviously innocent. But he says, there's a warrant for you. There's a warrant for you uh, for unpaid, unpaid violations. We're given a, court, a date to show up in court. This is a true story. Even though You're going to think I'm making this up. This is a true story. We show up to court. We're sitting in the back. And it's a small court in South Dakota somewhere. Right? And... And we're in the back, and we put on, you know, shirts and ties to try to look as innocent as possible. And they're rattling off names, and they get to Rosario, and they, they, they get to my brother's name. And the judge looks at the clerk and says, okay, pull, up the, pull it up, pull up the record. And the clerk is like, on her computer. And then there's awkward silence. She's like, and there's nothing. And she, she whispers to the judge, there's no record for Mr. Rosario. It's missing from the, from, from the computer. And I look at my brother and say, what the heck is going on here? And they're going back and forth whispering. And then the judge nervously looks up and he says, Mr. Rosario, it looks like the record is not in the computer. I guess you can go. <laughs> <laughs> and we get up and we're like, that's what I'm talking about, baby. The blood of Jesus wiped that record, right? <laughs> and, then, and then when I say that, we're like... Oh, snap, we better get out of here before they reboot the computer or something, right? <laughs> Grace, somehow that's related to the sermon. Grace and mercy, right? We're given what we do not deserve, and we don't get what we actually do deserve. Are you following what I'm saying? Forget about everything I just said. 
And let's go back to the typical conception of what we think about the judgment. It's a criminal case, let's say. Forget about that other judge. It's a criminal case. And in this criminal case, because this is the typical conception, there are um, participants, right? There are participants in the criminal case, right? We have the witness. And who's the witness in this case? <laughs> you better hope it's not your neighbor, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you're done, right? Jesus is the witness, right? Revelation 1.5, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the amen, the faithful and true witness. Revelation 3, verse 14, right? It, just use your imagination. You are in court to answer for your life. If that doesn't make you nervous, then you must glow in the dark or something, right? And they call the person to the witness stand, and you look up, and it's Jesus. Are you feeling good so far? Yes. Relieved. <laughs> But there's not just the witness that's called to the witness stand because there's other participants in the judgment, right? There's also the attorney, right? 1 John 2, 1, if any man sin, we have an advocate or we have an attorney or a lawyer, right? With the Father, Jesus Christ, the right, we have a mediator that stands in our place and argues our case. That's your attorney, right? One mediator who's able to save to the uttermost, He's making intercession for them. What does that mean, intercession? He fills his mouth with arguments on your behalf, right? So you're there in the court scene. The, the, the witness takes the stand, and it's Jesus, and you're excited, and you're so, you're so excited that the witness is Jesus that you turn around to celebrate with your lawyer, and when you turn around and you look, your lawyer is Jesus. And then you, you do a double take. You're like, wait, I thought you were just sitting in the witness stand, right? Jesus is your witness and Jesus is your attorney, but we don't just have an attorney. We also look up in the judgment bar and, and, and we have the judge, right? And the Bible says in John 5, the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to who? The to the son. John 5, it's Jesus who executes judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, it is the judgment seat of Christ, not the father, so you see the witness stand is Jesus. You're excited. You turn to tell your lawyer, and it turns out to be Jesus. And then you, you look up in the bar, and, and you look at the judge, and it turns out to be Jesus. How are you feeling at this point? I don't feel like you're excited enough. If you're not excited at this point, check your pulse because you're probably dead. Right? Can you conceive of a, of a better scenario than this? Uh, Michael Card has this beautiful song uh, called Jubilee. And in that song, there's this, there's this line. And he says, to be so completely guilty, given over to despair, and then to look into your judge's face and to see a savior there. I, I think that when we process what the Bible has been trying to tell us about the judgment all along, it's almost like how on earth, how on earth did we miss it? It's in our face, right? But will the judgment be fair? Absolutely not the judgment will not be fair because the judgment is rigged in your favor. That, I think, is the definition of unbelievable. That is unbelievably awesome. And not only is it beautiful, but thank God that it's beautiful and it just happens to be true as well. <laughs> and as we close, as I wrap this up here, um, it's even better. It's even better. Because all along, the most compelling message that the Bible gives us about the judgment is that it's not even you on the dock, in the dock, right? That God is the one who's under judgment. All along through Scripture, it's been trying to tell us this over and over and over again. It's God. God is the one that's in the dock. That the controversy that began this entire biblical narrative, we started this in the first weekend, right? We were in a garden in Genesis chapter 3, 
we have allegations against the character of God. That's what began this entire thing. The Bible is a long unfolding of God slowly revealing himself and his character, right? Which ultimately vindicates God's character. And the amazing thing of, the, of this all is that the only argument that God brings to the table in this scenario is pointing to the redeemed. So when you read in the book of Job and, 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 and you have this, this back and forth, back and forth that's taking place between God and Job, you remember what he says? Have you considered my servant Job? All the, the accusations that God faces, the answer to that, those accusations is the redeemed. Because if it's actually true that God is malignant, that God is a liar, that God cannot be trusted, if all of that is true, God's argument is, then what of these redeemed people that have given their hearts to the gospel and accepted Jesus? Right? So the ultimate argument in the judgment is the redeemed. Now, brothers and sisters, I leave you with this. You have to try really, really hard to blow it in the judgment. Are you with me? You have to try really hard to blow it. Because every single possible conceivable advantage that could have possibly been set up to rig this thing in order for your success and for my success has already been, has already been established. And so, I want to say, like the psalmist of old, like these weird prophets, like these weird people in Scripture who are longing for, who are celebrating, who are anticipating the judgment, who are actually praying for the judgment to come sooner, not later, I want to be the type of believer that is so sold out in trusting the heart of God, the motives of God, and the liberation of God that I actually want to pray for the judgment of God to come sooner. Are you with me? Yes. Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, that the very things that so many people are afraid of turn out to be the good news of the gospel. Lord, thank you that the gospel is not fair. Thank you that unmerited favor, that the guilty in place of the innocent, it overturns our very definitions of what, of what all of this means. And Father, I pray that you would, that you would harbor this truth in our hearts and that, would, that it would breathe revival into our experiences. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.